No, that's wrong and a rather naive way to think of science. Science can't simply argue away God as negative claims can't be proven. To wit, a person couldn't disprove the existence of an invisible pink unicorn. It's invisible, so you can't see it. It might not be right next to you, so you don't have to hear it. Unless you're touching it, you can't feel it. The default state for all positive claims is one of doubt. Therefore, science needn't disprove God. The burden of proof is on the creationists. And for unproved to untestable claims, Henry Drummond coined the term God of the Gaps. There will always be gaps for a God to hide in. We shouldn't let that stop the advance of knowledge. And I think it was just another act. Time out. Look at his eyes. Am I wrong or do they resemble shark eyes? I'm kind of weirded out. Anyway, since this has no bearing on intelligent design, I'm going to get back on topic. Catastrophic mistake to have someone like Dawkins uh, address himself to profound issues of theology, the existence of God, the nature of life. He hasn't committed himself to discipline study in any relevant area of inquiry. He's a crummy philosopher. He doesn't have the rudimentary skills to, to, to meticulously assess his own argument. Well, I've taken my share of philosophy classes. Allow me to dissect your argument. Rather than address Dawkins' basis for disbelief, which is to say his argument that there's no evidence or argument for intelligent design, God, or what have you, you argue that he's wrong because he's not qualified. This is a technique of rhetoric and also a logical fallacy, argument ad hominem. Basically, rather than attacking the argument, you attack his credibility. Besides, by your own argument, you yourself would be unqualified to address the issue, as you've spent your life on math and statistics, not philosophy. Shame on you, sir, for your dishonorable tactics. Genius guy, though. Very smart guy. A little bit of a reptile, but a very smart guy. <laughs> Said the shark-eyed fellow in the monkey suit. You've got two competing explanations of the evidence. One says design, one says undirected processes. And one of those has evidence. Both of them have larger philosophical or religious or anti-religious implications. So you can't say that one of those two theories is scientific and the other is unscientific simply because they have implications. Both have implications. The reason why intelligent design is a pseudoscience is because its predictions are not testable. It has nothing to do with the implications. People who tell you, for example, that science tells you all you need to know about the world, or that science tells you that religion is all wrong, or science tells you that there is no God, those people aren't telling you scientific things. They are saying metaphysical things, and they have to defend their positions for metaphysical reasons. Descartes' method of doubt means we can disregard any argument that lacks a valid basis. Science is backed by the argument that our perception of the universe can't come from nowhere. Although it is possible for our perception to be tricked, the chance of this can be minimized via control of variables and repetition. Religion lacks a sound argument. The ontological argument fails for two reasons. For one, more perfect is subjective. To wit, perfect circles exist only as idea. Thus, one could argue in order to be perfect, something can only exist as concept. What's more, the notion that because a being would be more supreme if it were real than if not, does not necessitate its existence. If we took the first of two odd premises as true, that an extant being is better than a non-existent one, if the extant one didn't exist, although a better being would be possible, if said better being didn't exist, the non-existent one becomes supreme. Meaning the contradiction is never reached, and the reductio ad absurdum argument is rendered void. The cosmological argument is likewise invalid for two reasons. For one, Aristotle used it to demonstrate that the universe was eternal. Nowadays, creationists call that an infinite regress. The second problem is it relies on the assumption that time is eternal. According to Big Bang Theory, space-time was more or less non-existent before the bang. Thus, without time there is no causality, and that breaks down the cosmological argument as causes must predate effects. No time, no one before the other. The teleological argument is essentially the watchmaker argument. The planets form because of gravity, the stars form because of gravity, and life formed from thermodynamics, mutation, and natural selection. 
See, here's the thing about metaphysics. I don't have to prove my statements beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't have to show with 100% certainty that they must have happened, but rather that they're simply plausible, which injects reasonable doubt into the argument from complexity. Once doubt gets into it, I can simply say prove it, and it goes away. The thing is, if you were to try the same technique on me, you'd get as far as prove it, and then I'd whip out my evidence and your attack would fail like a snowball against a brick wall. What is being presented to the public is, first comes the science, and then comes the worldview. I would want to argue that that may not be the case, that it may actually be the other way around. You don't want to sell me any biblical glasses. You want to go home and rethink your life. The founders of early modern science, Sir Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Johannes Kepler, Galileo, most of these uh, early scientists all not only believed in God, but they thought their belief in God actually made it easier to do science. Oh, indeed. Not being killed as a heretic does wonderful things for one's research. Admitting our biases is the best way towards rational discussion, which I would welcome. Foundational bias does not make for rationality. No gods, no life after death, no ultimate foundation for ethics. Ethics should not be gotten from the Bible, ever. In some places it advocates date rape and incest, in others genocide. Ethics should stem from empathy. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes. No ultimate meaning in life and no human free will are all deeply connected to an, an evolutionary perspective. You're here today and you're gone tomorrow, and that's all there is to it. Dr. Will Provine, professor of the history of biology at Cornell University, gave us another disturbing glimpse into where Darwinism can lead. Oh, I was a Christian, but I never heard anything about evolution because it was illegal to teach it in Tennessee. Dr. Provine's first biology professor changed all that. He started talking about evolution as if it had no design in it whatsoever. And I came up to him and I said, you've left out the most important part. And he said, if you feel the same way at the end of one quarter, I want you to stand up in front of the students in this class and tell them this deep lack in evolution. And I read that book so carefully, I could find no sign of there being any design whatsoever in evolution. And I immediately began to doubt the existence of the deity. This is disturbing how? He couldn't find evidence of a god, so he turned atheist. So what? Free will was impossible with a god anyway. See, essentially our choices are based on the circumstances at hand. Given a wide array of possible circumstances and a designer who can see the end result of each, by creating the world he'd lock in a set of circumstances, thus locking in our actions. Even if he chose not to select the circumstances, his choice of non-interference still chooses a consequence. As for death being final, you have no idea of the kind of torture it would be to live forever. You'd have a blast the first millennia or so, but you'd have eternity to live. There'd be no novelty to your life, no meaning, and eternity is one of the worst hells you could inflict upon a sentient being. A limited lifespan gives our life focus. We must enjoy life and we must not harm the lives of others.